the start of the First Dornish War can trace its roots to Aegon's conquest of Westeros. Queen Rhaenys Targaryen was sent to conquer Dorne in her brother's name. Instead of confronting the Dornish spearmen guarding the prince's pass in the Red Mountains, Rhaenys flew over the pass on her dragon Meraxis to the castles of Vaith and God's Grace. She found them abandoned and thus continued her journey to Plankytown where only women and children remained. When she did eventually reach Sunspear, the seat of House Martell, she found Mira Martell, the aged Princess of Dawn, waiting in her otherwise abandoned castle. Mira defied Rhaenys, despite her dragon, stating that they would neither fight nor kneel. Rhaenys warned the Princess of Dawn that House Targaryen would return with fire and blood. But Mira replied simply, You may burn us, my lady, but you will not bend us, break us, or make us bow. This is Dawn. You are not wanted here. Return at your peril. Rhaenys departed, but House Targaryen subsequently made no direct attempt to conquer Dawn or its harsh deserts, instead focusing on their main conquests in the heart of Westeros. That was until, in 4 AC, King Aegon I Targaryen, the Conqueror, launched an invasion of Dawn, intent on completing his conquest of Westeros. Although House Will led an assault against the Targaryen forces in the Boneway, the other Dornish lords abandoned their castles, neither willing to defend them nor willing to bend the knee. The first assault was led by Queen Rhaenys. On her way to Sunspear, she seized every Dornish seat she encountered in her path and she also had her dragon Meraxis burn the Planky Town. While the town itself was burnt to ash, few lost their lives as many jumped into the river to escape the flames. Meanwhile, King Aegon and Lord Harlan Tyrell fought in the Prince's Pass, facing heavy resistance as their forces were ambushed by the Dornish defenders, who fled and hid as soon as the dragons took to the air. The King's half-brother, Lord Oris Brathian, led a force through the Boneway, where he also faced similar issues with the Dornish. However, once through the Prince's Pass, Harlan Tyrell was faced with the Sands of Dawn, sands he would need to cross if he was to reach his goal of Hellholt. While leading his army to Hellholt, he saw many of his soldiers die of thirst due to the heat and general lack of water. Those who finally managed to reach Hellholt found the castle to be deserted, just like every other castle they came across. King Aegon briefly besieged Ironwood, which was defended by a few hundred old men, boys and women. He found Skyreach abandoned, but at Ghost Hill, he was challenged to single combat by Lord Tollan's champion. After Aegon had killed the man with Blackfire, he discovered the champion had in truth been Lord Tollan's mad fool. Worse, Ghost Hill turned out to be deserted as well. Lord Oris Baratheon fared worse in his assault up the Boneway. His army was pelted with rocks, arrows and spears from above, some of them poisoned, while his men were also murdered in the night. Towards the end, the Dornishmen blocked the Boneway on both fronts of Oris's army, and House Will managed to capture Lord Oris and many of his bannermen and knights. They would remain captives until 7 AC. When the Targaryens finally arrived at Sunspear, they discovered that Princess Mira had vanished, but they declared themselves victorious regardless. King Aegon and Queen Rhaenys placed Dawn under the rule of the Iron Throne. They returned to King's Landing, leaving Lord John Rosby as Castilian of Sunspear and the Warden of the Sands, and charged Lord Harlan Tyrell with putting down any revolts that might arise. Aegon and Rhaenys had only just returned to King's Landing when the Dornish rebelled against House Targaryen. From Sunspear's shadow city, Dornishmen came forth, quickly retaking the castle and killing all within. Lord Rosby, the Warden of the Sands, was captured and thrown from a window atop the spear tower by Princess Mira herself. In 5 AC, Lord Harlan Tyrell marched his army from Hellholt, where he had been garrisoned, intent on taking back Faith and Sunspear. But in the harsh deserts of Dawn, the entire army vanished, and their fate was never discovered, and remains a mystery to this day. Elsewhere, entire garrisons were put to the sword. The knights who had been in charge of the garrisons horrifically tortured and mutilated. Lord Will, called Will of Will, eventually agreed to ransom back Lord Oris Baratheon and the other captured lords. In 7 AC, terms were finally agreed and the captives were ransomed back 
for each man's weight in gold and set free. However, the will of will took off their sword hands, so they could never take up arms against Dawn again. Oris Baratheon became bitter and obsessed with revenge, and resigned his office as Hand of the King as a result, stating to Aegon, the hand should have a hand. Intent on revenge, King Aegon unleashed his dragons once again. The castles who remained defiant were burned again and again, whereupon the Dornishmen retaliated in 8 AC by setting half of the rainwood on Cape Wrath ablaze and sacked half a dozen towns and villages in the Dornish marches. In 9 AC, the dragons once again struck, burning several seats, but it was the next year Lord Fowler led a raiding party over the Red Mountains and attacked Nightsong in the Dornish marches, taking its defenders hostage, while Sir Geoffrey Dane marched an army to Old Town and raised the fields and villages nearby. But he was not able to take the city itself, thanks to its huge defensive walls. The Targaryens unleashed their dragons a third time, this time upon Starfall, the seat of House Dane, Skyreach, the seat of House Fowler, and Hellholt, the seat of House Ulla. But at Hellholt, the dragon Meraxis was shot down from the sky with Queen Rhaenys atop her back. Many thought the dragon's invincible. A scorpion bolt pierced the dragon's eye and Meraxis fell from the sky. Although the dragon destroyed the castle's highest tower and part of the curtain wall in its fall, the death of both the dragon and Queen Rhaenys was the greatest success the Dornish had against the Targaryens. In truth, the First Dornish War ended with the death of Rhaenys, and what came next was something different altogether. Aegon and Visenya, enraged at the loss of their beloved sister, had one thing in mind, revenge. With fire and blood, what would come next was the Dragon's Wrath. The next two years would later be called the Year of the Dragon's Wrath. The Targaryens burned every Dornish stronghold at least once, with the exception of Sunspear and its shadow city, but they turned the sands of Dawn into nothing but glass. The Dornish believed that the Targaryens refused to attack Sunspear because they were afraid that Princess Mira might have purchased a device from Lys to slay dragons with. Archmaester Timothy offers a different explanation, suggesting in his conjectures Aegon hoped that the burning of Dawn would instead turn the Dornish against House Martell. Indeed, letters have been discovered in which the Marcher Lords urged the Dornish to surrender while claiming that House Martell had purchased their safety from the dragons. Regardless of the truth, the Dornish Lords and small folk remained loyal. Aegon of Visenya also placed bounties on the heads of Dornish Lords, who in turn placed bounties on the Targaryens and their allies. Half a dozen Dornish Lords successfully assassinated, though only two of the killers ever lived to collect the bounties. King Aegon was attacked on three separate occasions and Visenya was attacked on several occasions as well. One day when Aegon and Visenya were assaulted on the streets of King's Landing, only Visenya's swift intervention saved Aegon's life. This attack led to the creation of the elite royal bodyguard known as the Kingsguard in 10 AC. Lord Fell was killed in a brothel while in King's Landing, while the Willow Will committed atrocities, particularly in Thorntown and Old Oak. Although Dawn was a blasted, burning ruin from the Red Mountains to the mouth of the Greenblood, the Dornish continued to fight. While a peace deal would eventually end the Dragon's Wrath in 13 AC, the damage done to the people of Dawn from the small folk to the High Lords could not be put into words. 10,000 died in Dragonfire, with some castles and towns wiped from the map, fading into the sands of time. While the peace would not last, with war regularly breaking out between Dawn and House Targaryen for the next 200 years. The way in which House Targaryen approached conflicts changed significantly, now approaching the Dornish with much more caution thanks to the wounds left by the death of Rhaenys and Meraxis. The Dornish approach changed somewhat in the hopes of avoiding another Dragon's Wrath. Many of the conflicts between Dawn and the Kingdom to the North would not officially be endorsed by House Martell, instead being undertaken by rebels or rogue lords thus ensured a fractious standoff where neither side was wanting to fully commit to their cause, knowing the high losses that would surely follow. The First Dornish War and the Dragon's Wrath that followed it cost both the Dornish and House Targaryen dearly. Many thousands of Dornish men and women died, and the war cost the life of the Conqueror's most beloved queen, Rhaenys, as well as the right hand of his base-born half-brother and his best friend, Oris Baratheon. But the peace that was forged in its wake did last. 
After the end of that first Dornish war, the king accepted Dornish independence and swore to uphold it. As a show of respect, he flew to Sunspear on the 10th anniversary of the peace for a feast of friendship with Daria Martel, the Princess of Dorn. His eldest son and heir, Prince Aenys, accompanied his father with Quicksilver, his young dragon. That peace, forged by Aegon and Daria, would last well into the reign of King Aenys, that is, until 37 AC. King Aenys was losing control of his kingdom and was faced with several uprisings at the same time. In the Vale, Lord Ronald Arryn's brother, Jonas Arryn, deposed him and declared himself King of the Vale. A religious uprising led by a warrior priest in the Iron Islands and in the Red Mountains of Dawn, a pretender dubbed the Vulture King had appeared and called on all true Dornishmen to rise against the Targaryens as revenge for the death and famine during the First Dornish War. Princess Daria denounced this vulture king and assured King Aenys House Martell and the noble houses of Dorne had no part in this outlaw's cause. But thousands still flocked to his banner, swarming over the Red Mountains and into the Reach, where they began raiding all along the Dornish marches and the borders of the Stormlands en masse. While the other uprisings across his kingdom were a concern to the king, the raiding in the Dornish marches was the most problematic and it was feared by the king's advisers that if action was not taken, King Aenys risked further rebellion in the Stormlands. Although Princess Daria Martell had issued a declaration denouncing the rebels, some of the king's advisers, including the Dowager Queen Visenya Targaryen, felt that she may have been playing a double game and sending them money and supplies. But this is only speculation and will never be proven and can never be proven. But given the tricky nature of the Dornish and the tactics they have used in the past, it would not be a surprise if it were true. But hundreds of knights and thousands of spearmen flocked to this vulture king's cause. But this large number made him reckless as he divided his strength time and time again while he marched west against Nightsong and Horn Hill with half of his men the other went east to besiege Stonehelm the seat of House Swan. Lord Walter Will was in command of their second force and was one of the few major Dornish lords to publicly support the actions of the Vulture King thanks to the hubris and overconfidence of the Vulture King. Both hosts met with disaster. Oris Baratheon the half-brother of the Conqueror now known as Oris One Hand after losing his sword hand during the First Dornish War, rode forth from Storm's End one last time to smash the Dornish beneath the walls of Stonehelm. When Lord Walter Will was captured, Lord Oris told him, Your father took my hand. I claim yours as repayment. He took Walter Will's sword hand, then the other, then both feet. Oris Baratheon, the bastard half-brother and best friend of King Aegon the Conqueror, died on the march back to Storm's End of wounds taken during the battle. His son, Davos, said he died content, smiling at the rotting hands and feet hanging from his tent. The Vulture King fared no better. Capturing Night Song was not possible, so he marched west, only to have Lady Karen sally forth behind him, joining her forces with Harman Dondarrion. Meanwhile, Lord Selmau Tali of Horn Hill suddenly ambushed the Dornish with knights and archers. He became known as Savage Sam when he cut down a dozen Dornishmen with his famed Valerian steel sword, Heartsbane. Stuck between three forces, the Dornish threw down their spears and shields and ran, but the March Lords rode after them and cut them down in what became known as the Vulture Hunt. The Vulture King was taken alive and tied naked between posts by Savage Sam Tarly. Rumours say he was torn apart by vultures, but more likely he died of thirst. His death saw the end of the Second Dornish War. In the year 61 AC, the Lord of Storm's End and King Jaehaerys Targaryen's stepfather and former hand, Lord Rogar Baratheon, would arrive in King's Landing unannounced. With Rogar came his two nieces and his own daughter by the King's late mother, Queen Alyssa Valarian, the Lady Jocelyn, the King's half sister, the small frail babe who had come into the world during the terrible year of the stranger, had grown into a beautiful, tall young girl with large dark eyes and hair as black as sin. Rogar Baratheon's own black hair had gone grey, however, and the years had started to take their toll on the old king's hand. His face was pale and lined, and he had grown so gaunt his clothes hung loosely upon him, as if they had been cut for a much larger, stronger man. When he took a shaky knee before the Iron Throne, he had trouble rising back to his feet and required the help of the King's Guard to stand. Lord Rogar had made the long trip from Storm's End to ask his stepson, the King, a favour. Lady Jocelyn, 
would soon be celebrating her seventh birthday. She'd never known a mother, the old man said. My brother's wives looked after her as much as they were able, but of course they favoured their own children as mothers will, and now both of them are gone. If it please you, sire, I would ask you to accept Jocelyn and her cousins as wards, to be raised here at court beside your own sons and daughters. It would be an honour and our pleasure, Queen Alessandra replied. Jocelyn is our own sister. We have not forgotten that. Our blood. Lord Rogar seemed much relieved by this, and the tension in the room began to lift. I would ask you to look after my son as well. Bormund will remain at Storm's End, as is his place, in the charge of my brother Garen. He's a good boy, a strong boy, and will grow into a great lord in time, but he's only nine years of age. However, Rogar Baratheon had come to the capital for much more pressing matters than finding places at court for his daughter. Years prior, his younger brother Boris left the Stormlands for Essos. He had now reappeared in Westeros, in the Red Mountains of Dawn. The rumour was he had joined up with the outlaw, known as the Vulture King, and was now leading raids against his own people in the Stormlands. My younger brother Garen is an able man and leal, but he was never a match for Boris, and Bormund is but a boy. I fear for what may befall them and the Stormlands when I am gone, the aged lord would tell the king. That too took the king aback. When you are gone, why should you be gone? Where would you mean to go, my lord? Lord Rogar's answering smile showed a glimpse of his once formidable ferocity. Into the mountains, your grace. Maesters say that I am dying, and I do believe them. But I would not die in a bed. I mean to find my brother and deal with him, and with his vulture king as well. When I die, it will be with an axe in my hand, screaming a curse. All I ask is for your leave, your grace. Moved by his old friend's words, King Jaehaerys rose and descended from the Iron Throne and clapped Lord Rogar by the shoulders. Your brother is nothing but a traitor, and this vulture, which I will not call a king, has vexed our marches long enough. You have my leave, my lord, and more than that, you have my sword. Whilst the Lord of Storm's End would lead 500 men into the mountains of the Dornish marches, Jaehaerys Targaryen took to the air on his dragon Vermithor. This was not the first vulture king to trouble the lords of Westeros, nor was it to be the last, but this second was no more than an up-jumped raider the minor son of a minor house with a few hundred followers who shared his taste for robbery and pillaging. He knew the mountains well, and when pursued, he would disappear to reappear at will. None of his tricks availed him against a foe who could hunt him from above, however. Legend claimed the Vulture King had an impregnable mountain castle hidden in the clouds, but King Jaehaerys found no secret lair, only a dozen small camps scattered here and there across the Red Mountains. One by one, Vermifor flamed them all, leaving the vulture only ashes to return to. Lord Rogar's slow-moving column winded their way into the heights, but were soon forced to abandon their horses and proceed on foot along goat tracks and steep slopes and through dark caves, whilst hidden foes rolled stones down about their heads. Yet still, they marched on, undaunted. As the Stormlanders proceeded from the east, Simon Dondarrion, the Lord of Blackhaven, led a small host of marcher knights into the mountains from the west to seal off any escape from that side, whilst the hunters crept towards one another. Jaehaerys watched them from the sky, moving them about as he had once moved toy armies in the chamber of the painted tables as a boy. In the end, they found their foe, Boris Baratheon, did not know the mountain's hidden ways as the Dornish did, so he was the first to be cornered. Lord Rogar's men made short work of his own, but as his brothers came face to face, King Jaehaerys descended from the sky. I would not have you named as a kinslayer, my lord, his grace told his former hand. The traitor is mine, Sir Boris laughed to hear it. So you would rather name me a kinslayer than him a kinslayer, he shouted. As he rushed the king, Jaehaerys, ever calm, had blackfire in hand and he had not forgotten the lessons he had learned in the yard on Dragonstone as a young boy. Boris Baratheon died at the king's feet from a cut to his neck that took his head near clean off. The Vulture King's turn came next. Brought to bay in the burned lair where he had hoped to find refuge, he resisted to the end, showering the king's men with spears and arrows. This one is mine, Rogar Baratheon told his grace. When the Mountain King was led before them in fetters, at his command the outlaw's chains were struck off, and was given a spear and shield. Lord Rogar faced him with his axe. If he kills me, promise me you'll let him go free. The vulture proved sadly unequal to that task. Wasted and weak and wrecked with pain as he was, Rogar Baratheon turned the Dornishman's attacks aside contemptuously, then clove him from shoulder to navel. When it was done, Lord Rogar seemed wary. 
It seems I will not die with an axe in hand after all, he told the king sadly. Nor did he. Rogar Baratheon, the Lord of Storm's End, and one time handed the king and Lord Protector of the Realm, died half a year later at Storm's End, in the presence of his maesters, his septons, his brother and son and heir, Bormund. Lord Rogar's war would become known in the pages of history as the Third Dornish War. It lasted less than half a year, begun and won entirely in 61 AC, with the Vulture King eliminated. Raiding fell off sharply along Dornish marches for a time, as accounts of the campaign spread through the Seven Kingdoms. Even the most martial of lords gained a new respect for their young king. Any lingering doubts had been dispelled. Jaehaerys Targaryen was worthy of Aegon the Conqueror's throne, and was not weak like his father, King Aenys. The year of 83 AC is remembered as the year of the Fourth Dornish War, better known amongst the small folk of Westeros as Prince Morian's Madness, or the War of a Hundred Candles. The old Prince of Dawn had died, and his son, Morian Mattel, had succeeded him in Sunspear. The new prince was rash, and a foolish young man, who had long bristled at his father's cowardice during Lord Rogar Baratheon's war, when the Lord of Storm's End led knights of the Seven Kingdoms into the Red Mountains, allowing them to march through their lands with impunity, leaving them unmolested. Whilst the Dornish armies stayed at home, and left the Vulture King, the leader of a group of outlaws, frequently attacking Westeros, deep into the marshes, to his fate. With the old Prince of Dawn leaving the popular outlaw to his fate, many in Dawn began to see House Martell as weak, and nothing but the lapdogs of the dragon lords of House Targaryen. Prince Morian also felt this way, and was determined to avenge this stain on Dornish honour. The prince planned his own invasion of the Seven Kingdoms. It was a popular idea, and reignited the fire within the Dornish lords to stand up to the might of House Targaryen, like they had when Aegon conquered the rest of Westeros. Though he knew well, Dawn could not hope to prevail against the might that the Iron Throne could muster against him in a conventional war. Prince Morian thought that he might take King Jaehaerys Targaryen unawares and conquer the Stormlands as far south as Storm's End, or at the very least Cape Wrath deeper into the Seven Kingdoms than any Dornish ruler had attacked and held for hundreds of years. Rather than attack by way of the Prince's Pass, the only real way to move a large army through the Red Mountains, Prince Morian planned to come by sea. He would assemble his host at Ghost Hill and the Tor, load them onto ships and sell them across the Sea of Dawn to take the Stormlanders by surprise, as he believed the spies and scouts of the Iron Throne would have their focus on the Prince's Pass. If he was defeated or driven back, so be it, but before he went, he swore to burn a hundred towns and raise a hundred castles, so the Stormlanders might know they could never again march into the Red Mountains with impunity. The madness of this plan can be seen in the fact that there are neither a hundred towns nor a hundred castles on Cape Wrath, nor even a third of that number. Dawn had not boasted any strength at sea since Nymeria burned her ten thousand ships, but Prince Morian did have gold, and he found winning allies in the Pirates of the Stepstones, the Salsals of Mir, and the Corsairs of the Pepper Coast. Though it took him the best part of a year, eventually the ships came straggling in, and the Prince and his spearmen were loaded aboard. Morian had been weaned on the tales of past Dornish glory. Like many young Dornish lords, he had seen the sun-motted bones of the dragon Meraxis at Hellholt, where Queen Rhaenys Targaryen, the beloved wife and sister of Aegon the Conqueror, and her dragon was shot down and killed during the First Dornish War. Every ship in his fleet was therefore manned with crossbowmen, and equipped with massive scorpions of the sort that had failed Meraxis. If the Targaryens dared to send dragons against him, he would fill the air with bolts and kill them all. Not an awful plan, but by far as sound as the prince had thought. In truth, the folly of Prince Morian's plans could not be overstated, despite the sound concept. His hope of taking the Iron Throne unaware was laughable. Not only did Jaehaerys have spies in Morian's own court, he had friends amongst the shrewder Dornish lords. But the pirates of the Stepstones, the Salsals of Mir, and the Corsairs of the Pepper Coast are none of them famed for their discretion. You cannot hide that many ships, and an army that size, for long. For the sheer amount of time it took everyone to muster, a few coins changing hands was all it took. By the time Morian set sail, the king had known of his attack for half a year. Borman Baratheon, the Lord of Storm's End had been made well aware as well, and was waiting on Cape Wrath to give the Dornishmen a red welcome. When they came ashore, he would never have that chance. Jaehaerys Targaryen and his two eldest sons, Aemon and Balon, had been waiting as well, and as Morian's fleet beat its way across the Sea of Dawn, the dragons, Vermithor, Caraxes and Vagar, fell on them out of the clouds. Shouts rang out, and the Dornish filled the air with scorpion bolts. But firing at a dragon is one thing, and killing it is quite another. A few bolts glanced at the scales of the dragon, and one punctured through Vagar's wing. 
but none of them found any vulnerable spots as the dragon swooped and banked and loosed great blasts of fire. One by one, the ships went up in gouts of flame. They were still burning when the sun went down, like a hundred candles floating on the sea. Burned bodies would wash up on the shores of Cape Wrath for half a year, but not a single living Dornishman set foot upon the Stormlands. The Fourth Dornish War was fought and won in a single day. The pirates of the Stepstones, the Salsals of Mir, the Corsairs of the Pepper Coast, became less troublesome for the Iron Throne for some time, and Mira Martel became the Princess of Dawn, a princess much more willing to work with the Iron Throne than attack it. Back in King's Landing, King Jaehaerys and his sons received a riotous welcome. Even Aegon the Conqueror had never won a battle without losing a single man. King Aegon III Targaryen died in the 26th year of his reign in the year 157 AC, at the young age of 37. While the king was still a young man when he died, he looked much older than his 37 years. Given his troubled life and the stresses he endured during and after the Dance of the Dragons, his sickly look and early death surprised very few at court. In truth, the king died inside the day he witnessed his mother, Queen Rhaenyra, killed by his uncle, King Aegon II, in the last days of the Dance of the Dragons. The trauma of that event never left him and haunted him till the end of his days. While King Aegon III only lived 37 years, mentally he had been through much more than most men his elder and all of it took its toll. Opinion on Aegon by the lords and small folk seems very neutral with very few actively disliking him or taking issue with his rule. But at the same time, he was hardly anyone's favourite king. While his reign was filled with some turbulence, mostly during the Regency period, King Aegon III did bring the stability the Seven Kingdoms needed in the wake of the Dance of the Dragons, while the wounds left by the war began to heal. He had also brought stability to House Targaryen, by providing a clear and secure line of succession that would hopefully mean an event such as the Dance of the Dragons could never tear House Targaryen or the wider kingdom apart again. It was hoped at the time that this would be the last civil war among the members of the royal family. In truth, that hope would simply be a dream and few could predict the events that would transpire over the next few decades. Aegon left behind two sons, Daeron and Baelor, and three daughters, Dana, Reyna, and Elena, as well as his queen, Dana Valarian, and his younger brother, Prince Viserys, who had been serving his brother faithfully as Hand of the King for many years prior to his death. The eldest of King Aegon's sons, Daeron, was only a boy of 14 when he assumed the throne. While he was older than his father when he came to power, Daeron was still not yet a man and had not come of age. Perhaps because of Daeron's notable charm or genius, or perhaps because of the memory of what transpired during the bloody regency period of Daeron's father, Prince Viserys wisely chose not to insist upon a regency period while the young king was in his minority. Instead, Viserys chose to serve as hand while King Daeron ruled ably and capably, but at the same time being willing to learn about the pitfalls of governance from his uncle. It was hoped that the team of Daeron and Viserys would bring a new age of prosperity to the realm. While there was some pushback at the idea of no regency, many who raise objections tended to be men hoping for a position on the proposed regency council. In the end, any who dissented loudly enough to become a problem were reminded that the legendary king Jaehaerys hardly had a regency period when he was in his minority, and even during that brief time, the king was a power in his own right, thanks to Jaehaerys' willfulness and determination to be listened to, and is remembered as perhaps the best king Westeros ever saw. At the time of his coronation, few in the realm foresaw that Daron, the first of his name, would cover himself in glory on the scale not seen since the days of Aegon the Conqueror himself, whose ruby crown he wore. The choice of using the Conqueror's crown was deliberate. His father, King Aegon III, had preferred a simple circle to match his modest dress. The choice of the Conqueror's ornate ruby crown was meant to send a message to the realm that Daron was not his father. In fact, he was different in many ways, but at heart he would make a strong king. Yet all the glory Daron would achieve during his short reign turned to ashes almost as swiftly. He was said by those who knew him that he was a youth of rare brilliance and forcefulness that there was a true fire within him, driving him onwards, that in many ways he was a dragon made flesh. King Daeron at first met resistance from his uncle and hand Prince Viserys and his counsellors and many great lords up and down Westeros, with the exception of the Marcher lords, 
when he first proposed to complete the conquest, something that had eluded every Targaryen king before him, something that even Aegon the Conqueror could not achieve, an idea so challenging that most kings never even considered it in the first place, but not so with this ambitious young king. It was Daron's aim to bring the southernmost kingdom of Westeros, Dawn, into the realm at last, and under the control of House Targaryen, completing Aegon's dream of united Westeros, seven kingdoms under one king. This would not be an easy task. There had been several small wars with Dawn in the years since the conquest, but not on the scale that Daron was proposing. His small council did their best to make the case for peace, and his lords reminded them that unlike the Conqueror and his sisters, he had no more dragons fit for war, and slim to no chance of hatching the remaining eggs on Dragonstone. To this, Daron famously responded, You have a dragon, he stands before you. King Daron I Targaryen's proposal to complete the conquest and capture a dawn in the name of House Targaryen took all by surprise. From his hand, Prince Viserys, to the lords up and down Westeros, it is said his small council and his hand spent meeting after meeting, spanning several hours each time, trying to talk the king down from his drastic idea. While the Seven Kingdoms were at a peace with Dawn, despite countless petty conflicts over the centuries, it was still a peace, with the shadow left by the Dance of the Dragons casting a looming shadow over the idea of breaking it unprovoked by House Martell, was not an appealing prospect. There was also those who wondered if the Seven Kingdoms was ready for another war, and how many men would answer the call while the events of the dance were still in living memory. But for the small council, the biggest single concern was how House Targaryen would fare at warfare without the aid of their now dead dragons. If Dawn could not be held with the dragons, how would they be able to hold them without them? But in the end, despite the countless warnings and fears of his hand, small council and lords, the young dragon, King Daeron, could not be gainsaid, and it is said that when he talked of Dawn, it lit a fire inside him, and that perhaps he truly was a dragon made flesh. If this invasion was going to be successful, they would need a plan, a good plan at that. By the year 157 AC, there had been several attempts to conquer Dawn and countless petty conflicts with them. Even at the peak of Targaryen power in Westeros, and with the use of their dragons, they were unable to capture and hold Dawn, with the Dawnish becoming a thorn in the side of many king. If Daron's dream was to come to fruition, he would need to draw from the experience and knowledge of all his loyal and trusted lords. Plan, the king did, and he did so with the help and advice of Alan Valarian, with the unquestioning support of the legendary Oakenfist, who had spent significant time in Dawn and at the court of House Martell. Some began to think it could indeed be done. It would be a bloody and hard-fought conflict, but perhaps this time the victory that had eluded House Targaryen would come. There are some at the Citadel who argue that in some ways, Daron's plan for the proposed campaign approved upon that of Aegon the Conqueror's own, despite the loss of the Targaryen dragons in the dance. In some ways, the lack of dragons made his first generation of post-dance Targaryens an unknown quantity. When Daron's invasion did finally begin, after countless time planning, he amply proved his prowess on the fields of Dawn, which for hundreds of years had defied the Reach, the Stormlands, and even the dragons of House Targaryen. King Daron divided his host into three separate forces. One was led by Lord Tyrell of Highgarden, who moved his host down the Prince's Pass at the western end of the Red Mountains of Dawn. The second one was led by Lord Alan Valarian, the Oakenfist, who was of course travelling by sea, passing through the Stepstones and into the waters of the coast of the Arm of Dawn. The third and final host was led by King Daron, the young dragon himself. The king marched down the treacherous pass known as the Boneway, where he made use of goat tracks and hidden passes that many, even among the Dornish, considered too dangerous. This bold and unpredictable move by Daron allowed him to go around the Dornish watchtowers and traps that had been set there for centuries. The very same watchtowers and traps that had once caught out Oris Baratheon, the hand of the king and half-brother to Aegon the Conqueror, during the First Dornish War. In the years directly after the conquest, Oris's capture in the Boneway resulted in the loss of his sword hand. The young dragon, once successfully through the Boneway, then swept away every force that sought to stop him, taking many of his foes by surprise. The prince's pass was won with a similar ease by Lord Tyrell, and most importantly, 
to the success of the invasion effort, the royal fleet broke the Planky Town and was then able to drive themselves up the Greenblood River into the heart of Dawn itself. Again, another unprecedented and unforeseeable act in the eyes of many of the Dornish. After this first initial push into the Red Sands of Dawn, Dawn itself had effectively been divided in half by Lord Allen's control of the Greenblood River and the waters around the now ruins of Planky Town. This means that the Dornish forces in the east and west could not aid one another directly, but it also cut off vital supply lines across the country, with House Martel unable to provide much needed supplies, food and fresh drinking water to their forces in the west. From this stemmed a series of bold and bloody battles that would take countless volumes of books in the libraries of the Citadel to recite in full. There are even several smaller skirmishes whose details have not been recorded at all due to the sheer scale of Daron's invasion. Out of all the accounts of the war that can be found, the best of them is the Conquest of Dawn, which is supposedly King Daron's own account of his campaign, which is rightly considered a marvel of its elegant and simplicity in both its prose and in its strategies. While Daron had successfully managed to capture most of Dawn, one huge task still remained to him, one that would not be so easy, and one which held the key to successfully holding Dawn, the capture of Sunspear and subjugation of House Martel. King Daron I Targaryen's initial invasion of Dawn surprised all with its speed and the scale of his success. Even his most loyal supporters could not have foreseen how sound and unquestioned the success of this initial invasion was. The plan devised by King Daron and Alan Balarian, the Oaken Fist, to attack from three different directions with the aim of dividing Dawn in half, thus blocking supply lines and any hope of reinforcement, was a stroke of genius especially the bold move of sending the royal fleet up the Greenblood River, which proved to have a huge impact on the success of the invasion. Even without dragons, the main power behind House Targaryen since Aegon the Conqueror took Westeros 158 years before, King Daron's invasion was perhaps the most effective and efficient, with some making the argument that the fact he did it all without dragons meant Daron's invasion outclassed the first invasion of Aegon the Conqueror and any that followed him. As word of the success of Daron's invasion spread from the Sands of Dawn to the Wall in the far north, the mood of the lords and small folk alike turned from pessimism and doubt to begrudging support, with some formerly doubtful lords sending additional men to aid in Daron's efforts. Every time House Targaryen had attempted to invade Dawn, it was always pushed back or undone very quickly, so much so that many in both Dawn and the rest of Westeros found an invasion may not physically be possible, owing to the harsh terrain and tactics used by the Dornish themselves, who used Dawn's harsh landscape to their advantage. The invasion even took House Martell by surprise, who had assumed that without dragons, House Targaryen would stand little or no chance in the sands of Dawn, let alone achieve the success they did in such a short amount of time. No one predicted or foresaw an attack let alone at the scale and speed of King Daron's. In many ways, the Dornish had no time to react or coordinate a proper counter-offensive. Within a year at the start of the conquest, the invaders were at the gates of Sunspear, the gleaming capital of Dawn. Before Daron could capture Sunspear itself, he needed to battle his way through the so-called Shadow City. While the odds were very much in Daron's favour at this point, Sieges often give the defender an advantage when it comes to physical combat. It would be a hard-fought bloody process, playing into the strengths of the Dornish hit-and-run guerrilla tactics that were the bane of many invader. The Dornish knew their city well and knew how best to defend it, but inevitably the Shadow City was taken, followed quickly by the fall of Sunspear itself in a similar hard-fought process. By the year 158 AC, the Prince of Dawn himself and two score of the most powerful Dornish lords bent their knee to King Daron at the submission of Sunspear. The young dragon had accomplished what Aegon the Conqueror never had, and no king since could achieve. The mass bending of the knee would leave a bitter taste in the mouth of many of the Dornish lords. As is the way with the Dornish, despite the submission of House Martell and the great lords, there were smaller factions that refused to surrender and would fight on regardless of the odds of success. To the bitter and bloody end. They would never surrender, no matter how good the terms presented by Daron were, or how hopeless their situation looked. Most of these rebels remained away from the larger towns and settlements, and hid themselves in the desert 
high in the almost impregnable mountain passes. Tactics that had famously worked during Aegon the Conqueror's first invasion of Dawn and had allowed for the Dornish to defend their land ever since were put into practice. These men were swiftly branded as outlaws by King Daron and they were not taken as a serious threat to the king's plans for Dawn. Ultimately, however, these outlawed men were small in number and very fragmented across the entirety of Dawn. Another pressing issue King Daron faced, and one there was no quick fix for, was the discontent among the Dornish small folk at the prospect of their new Targaryen overlords. The invasion had been bloody, with many small folk left bereft and fearing for what their lives would look like under House Targaryen. Many saw the Targaryens as the old enemy, not just in the 158 years since Aegon the Conqueror, but much further back to the days of old Valyria at its height of power and the destruction of the Rhoynar, who many of the Dornish descended from via Princess Nymeria and her 10,000 ships, who fled the dragon flame of the Dragon Lords, who reduced the cities that trailed up and down the Rhoyne River to nothing but ash. There were some who feared the same fate would have awaited the Dornish if not for the death of the last dragon. But regardless, King Daron had captured Dawn in spectacular style. Now for many came the hard part, and the part that was the undoing of many Targaryen kings before him, keeping it. In the year 158 AC, King Daron I Targaryen had invaded and captured Dawn in quick and decisive fashion, to the surprise of all. But looking back through the last 150 years of Targaryen history, it shows us Capturing Dawn is one matter. Controlling it was another altogether. The people of Dawn were tough and strong-willed and would not idly sit back and allow themselves to be subjugated by a foreign invader without a long and bloody hard-fought fight. Almost as soon as Sunspear was taken, bands of rebels and outlaws popped up all across Dawn. While for now, nothing more than a nuisance for Daron, but an issue that would need to be dealt with before it grew into a bigger, more dangerous problem. However, King Daron did quickly consolidate his control of Dawn, dealing with these small bands of rebels when he found them, be it in the desert or in the high passes of the Red Mountains. The king knew if he was to keep his new conquest, no mercy could be shown to the outlaws, but ridding himself of these rebels was not without difficulty. In fact, it could be argued that putting down each and every band of outlaws took longer and was more troublesome than the actual invasion. In one infamous episode, a poison arrow meant for the king was instead taken by his cousin, Prince Aemon, the younger son of Prince Viserys. The young prince, who was 22 years of age, was sent home by ship from Sunspear to recover. While Aemon did survive the incident, there were some who feared for the prince's life when he boarded the ship back to King's Landing. Even so, by the year 159 AC, the hinterlands were pacified, the rebels under control, and the young dragon, King Daron, was now free to return in triumph to King's Landing, with Dawn firmly under the control of House Targaryen. The king did not trust any of the Dornish lords to keep his peace in his new kingdom, so Lord Tyrell and a contingent of the royal army and fleet stayed in Dawn to keep the peace. There were some fears that the removal of so much of the Targaryen force from Dawn would spark new uprisings, but Daron had an answer for that he hoped would prevent this, as assurance for Dawn's future loyalty to the Iron Throne and good behaviour. Fourteen highborn hostages of the greatest houses of Dawn were carried back with King Daron to King's Landing to act as hostages, and with the hopes that these hostages in the capital could build bridges between the Dornish houses and the rest of the Seven Kingdoms. The sons and daughters, almost all the great houses of Dawn, were selected all had to send a hostage, all willingly did. This tactic proved less effective than Daron might have hoped. Whilst the hostages helped ensure the continued loyalty of their own blood, the king had not anticipated the tendencies of Dawn's small folk on such a massive scale. The issue was the king had no hold on them, or way of keeping them in line, such as the great houses. 10,000 men, it is said, died in the battle for Dawn, 40,000 more died over the course of the following three years, as common Dornishmen fought on stubbornly against the king's men. Lord Tyrell, whom Daron had left in charge of Dawn, valiantly attempted to quell the fires of rebellion, travelling from castle to castle with each turn of the moon, 
punishing any supporters of the rebels with the noose, burning down the villages that harboured the outlaws, and so on. But the small folk struck back, and each new day they found their supplies stolen or destroyed, camps burned, horses killed, and slowly the count of the dead soldiers and men at arms rose, killed in the alleyways of the shadow city, ambushed amidst the dunes, murdered in their camps. But the true rebellion began when Lord Tyrell and his train travelled to Sandstone, where his lordship was murdered in a bed of scorpions. As word spread of his demise, open rebellion swept Dawn from one end to the other. Dornish letters recorded in Maester Garth's Red Sands suggest that Lord Corgyle, Lord of Sandstone himself, arranged for Lord Tyrell's murder. However, his motives were subject of speculation in later years. Some say he grew angry that his early show of loyalty by putting an end to the rebel rousing of one of the more notorious rebel lords was given such little consideration by Lord Tyrell, while others claimed that his initial aid was all part of a treacherous plan he made with his Castilian to lull the king and Lord Tyrell into trusting him. In 160 AC, the young dragon himself was forced to return to Dawn to put down the rebels. He won several small victories as he fought through the Boneway, while Lord Alan Oakenfist descended once again upon the Planky Town and the Greenblood. Apparently broken and defeated in 161 AC, the Dornishmen agreed to meet to renew their fealty and discuss terms of surrender, but it was treachery and murder they plotted, not peace. In a bloody betrayal, the Dornish attacked the young dragon and his retinue beneath a banner of peace. Three knights of the Kingsguard were slain attempting to protect the king, with a fourth, to his eternal shame, who threw down his sword and yielded. Prince Aemon, the Dragon Knight, the youngest son of Prince Viserys, was once again wounded, and this time captured, but not before cutting down two of the betrayers. The young dragon, King Daron himself, died with the Sword of Kings, Blackfire, in his hand, surrounded by a dozen enemies, cutting down several before being overwhelmed and cut down himself. King Daron I's reign was thus only four short years in length. He died at the age of only 18. While he did achieve great feats during his short reign as king, his ambition had proved too great, and he paid the price. Glory may be everlasting, yet it is fleeting, as well soon forgotten in the aftermath of even the most famous victories, if they lead to great disaster. Mm -hmm.